Hello, everybody. Happy Friday, and welcome to another edition of Brain Scratch. I'm John Lorden, and today we're going to be diving into a case that, quite honestly, could almost be a plot for a James Bond film. Uh, this picture behind me is Gareth Williams. Gareth Williams um, had a bit of a storied career. He worked at GCHQ, which from my understanding is the English equivalent of kind of our NSA program. Basically, they monitor communications to try to seek out uh, terroristic activities and uh, things of that nature. Um, he worked there for about 10 years, and then he went to MI6. And if I recall correctly, I think James Bond actually works for MI5. MI6 is kind of an oversight to the MI5 uh, department, and they have to do more with kind of that same kind of thing, um, more about the planning, more about uh, intelligence work to set up the types of cases, although apparently they do have their own agents as well. As a matter of fact, one of the twists in this story about Gareth is he had recently just gained um, some training and clearance to possibly participate as an agent. I believe doing some field operations, but I'm not totally um, certain about that. However, despite all of that, it seems like um, Gareth was not quite happy in his job at MI6. He talked about a, um, a drinking culture that um, seemed to bother him and some of the office politics seemed to get to him. Uh, this was a guy that was extremely bright. I believe by the age of 17 he had already earned a degree and then he went to Cambridge and decided that uh, he wasn't learning enough at Cambridge so he stopped going there and jumped into working. Um, kind of a mathematical genius. I think he's also a programming type prodigy. And there is some conflicting stories about what happened to him, but ultimately in August of 2010 he was found dead. And there is a lot of, I don't know if it's intentional misinformation, but in researching this case it's been a bit difficult for me to find direct sources about where some of this information comes from. Um, the media has covered this case extensively. Uh, it's called one of the greatest mysteries uh, in England in terms of this type of occurrence, you know, a, a mysterious death, an unsolved crime, or potentially a suicide, and that is one of the other aspects to this case. So let's start just with the uh, what I consider always a source of the public's perception, Wikipedia. They have a whole article here on the death of Gareth Williams, and of course the links will be in the description box below. By the way, sorry about last week. I know I got them there a little bit late, but as soon as I heard they were missing, I jumped in and added them. So if you're curious about any of the links from last week, go back to that video and you should be able to find them now. Gareth Williams, born September 26, 1978, died on August 16th, 2010, was a Welsh mathematician and employee of GCHQ, seconded to the Secret Intelligence Service, SIS, or MI6, who was found dead in suspicious circumstances at a security service safe house flat in Pimlico, London, on the 23rd of August, 2010. The inquest found that his death was unnatural and likely to have been criminally meditated. A subsequent Metropolitan Police reinvestigation concluded that Williams's death was probably an accident. You know, it's kind of curious, but a lot of these stories that we at least go, uh, that we cover here on Brain Scratch seem to wind up, um, at least from the police perception, as most likely an accident, probably an accident. And there are some reasons why you might think that in this case. So let's dive a little deeper. He was found in a bag, uh, just like this one, um, in a bathtub. And one of the curious things is the heat was turned up in this safe house. That's another thing that's curious about it. This was actually a safe house of MI6s, which uh, supposedly I would think that they would pick because it should have some decent type of security, possibly other officers living um, close to it. Uh, so it's just, it's strange to me right off the bat that this type of occurrence would happen in one of their own safe houses. Uh, but that being said, Gareth was found inside a bag that was just like this. It was zipped completely closed, and there was a padlock put on the zipper. Um, and it was found in a bathtub. 
So um, on top of that, I mentioned the heater was turned on. It was, this is during summer months. People have looked at the range of how the weather was during this time, and there really isn't a good excuse for the heater to be on, especially full blast during that. Um, some people theorize that that had to do with speeding up the decomposition process. Um, also, with him being in the bathtub, if there were fluids that were leaking from the bag, it would easily go down the drain might potentially have been a bit of a system to limit the smell in terms of it emanating out into um, the rest of the public areas where someone might notice it. Um, there's also some big questions in terms of MI6 and how they responded. Uh, apparently he was supposed to be at work for an entire week that he was missing before MI6 um, called in to the police department and said, hey, we think there's something wrong. That prompted the police department to just do a stop by, a safety check, and that's how they found the bag. And then they sliced the bag, I believe, and found that there was a body in it. Um, and that turned it into a crime scene immediately. So people are a bit suspicious about his supervisor. Why didn't his supervisor report this earlier? Supposedly, there was a meeting he was supposed to give, um, actually two meetings, the week that he was missing. So it seems like people would have expected him to be at work. It was extremely out of character for him to not be at work. Um, and then also you get this barrage of other stories that start coming out very quickly about the scene. One of those is that there was a woman's wig uh, on one of the chairs and there was over 20,000 pounds worth of female clothing, uh, pounds as in the currency, <laughs> for you Americans, thinking, wow, that's, that's a lot of heavy clothes. Um, but there was a substantial amount of female clothing that was found on the scene also, and I noticed, at least from the shots of the scene, it looked like there was several other bags like this one, but they were yellow. Um, I don't know if the clothes were in those bags or not, and we'll get into a bit of a theory about um, him being a potential cross-dresser. But, of course, the press started reporting that, um, you know, he might have been a homosexual. There was a club that I guess is known to be a homosexual club that it's saying that he was frequenting. Um, I saw reports from a reporter that went and spoke to the management of that club. They say that we don't know this guy. We have no idea where these reports are coming through or coming from. So once again, just the more you look into this case, there is so much information being blasted at you, but trying to find the sources of that information gets a little tough. And the few opinions that I think we should really um, pay attention to, it seems like they're being dismissed. So is this potentially some type of cover up for um, him being killed by a, another spy agency, possibly his own spy agency? Is this truly a suicide? Is this a sex act gone wrong? We're going to talk about all that stuff as we go, but let's stick with the basics of the case for now. This is a picture from, they had an, an expert that basically tried to lock himself into the bag, and um, he's the same size, actually just a little bit smaller than Gareth, and he's tried it hundreds of, hundreds of times. He's kind of become this expert. You'll see him quoted in a lot of different articles commenting on this case, even in other aspects that aren't really in his expertise. Um, but in short, in the, in the video that I saw of him trying this, he's able to get himself in the bag. But there is a serious issue in that he is hampered by the bathtub. It's a bit tough to do it. Uh, even if he got himself in the bag and closed the zippers, putting the lock on it outside is extremely tough. Now, is it impossible? We're going to touch on that a little bit later as well. Um, so, but the thing that's really, really tough about all this is the fact that there were no fingerprints, no smudge marks, nothing found on the actual bathtub, no footprints found in the bathroom. It seems like there is a lot of potential for this scene to have been cleaned by an expert that knows how to remove DNA. Now, there were a couple of DNA samples that were found. Apparently, those became an issue when they ran the samples and it, they turned up to be the same result as the technician that was running the samples. So there was obviously some type of contamination that happened there. I don't know if that damaged the original sample or if the technician had inadvertently caused um, you know, corruption to the crime scene, the technician that lifted those samples. Once again, that story gets fuzzy. 
Um, but very, very strange that there are no handprints, fingerprints. I mean, Gareth, if he was living in this place, you would assume that he, he should have left some fingerprints on that bathtub at some point, let alone outside, or let alone when he was trying to put himself into this bag. As you can see, it, there was, there's a bit of leverage that needs to, to happen for you to do that uh, to yourself. And it just seems highly suspicious that there is no marks. There was, however, a smudge mark found on the edge of the rim, and some people believe that that smudge mark might have been caused by the bag actually being lifted and put into the tub, possibly with Gareth already in it. So there's a lot of speculation about um, did he die from did he die from being in the bag? Did he suffocate to death, which apparently would have taken about 20 to 30 minutes with that bag closed, or was he possibly knocked out by some drug first, then put into the bag? Um, we're not really sure. I don't, I don't know if we'll ever be sure at this point. So we have some information here from the coroner, um, who, in an interesting turn, you know, in the cases we've reviewed here on Brain Scratch before, it usually seems like the police line up their feelings with the coroner's reports and make sure that the coroner's report seems to match what their opinion is. In this case, we have almost the police department at odds with the coroner's recommendation. The coroner concluded he was probably killed unlawfully with poisoning and asphyxiation, the foremost contenders. Coroner Dr. Fiona Wilcox said he found the lack, she found the lack of hand and footprints in Mr. Williams' bathroom significant, concluding that a third party moved the bag containing Gareth into the bath. She was also highly critical of the way the police and security services dealt with the death, highlighting mix-ups in DNA and evidence submitted late or mishandled. She speculated that leaks about his private life to the press were an attempt by some third party to manipulate the evidence. And she said security service involvement in his death remained a legitimate line of inquiry. So, as you can see, it seems like the coroner highly suggests that this was done to him. This isn't something he would have done himself. Apparently, a few pieces of evidence popped up in terms of internet searches where he might have been looking at some pictures related to bondage. Um, there is also a story, once again, I don't know how true it is, from his previous landlords that one time they heard him calling for help and they uh, entered his apartment and found him handcuffed to his bed. He said he was trying to do some type of escapism trick, which kind of makes you think is, I mean, is this guy some type of wannabe Houdini? And that's really what sticks with me a little bit. There doesn't seem to be any evidence that he was really a fan of escapism in particular. Um, I have found no information about, you know, books about Houdini, searches about Houdini. People that are into escapism quite typically um, I mean, some of them go way overboard in terms of their fascination with Houdini. Uh, but even without it being specifically Houdini, if he was really researching that kind of thing or interested in that kind of thing, I would expect them to find a sub substantial amount of information about that. Um, also, in terms of it being some type of sex thing gone wrong, what kind of sex thing is this? Now, there is something... Um, Oh, it's slipping my mind uh, right. Oh, claustrophilia is the name of it. And apparently some people do appear to enjoy being confined in tight spaces um, during sexual acts. However, there is no other information that's been released to support that. Is it a sexual act in itself for you to just tie yourself up in a bag and be stuck in it? Uh, I don't know. Also worth noting, the key was actually in the bag with him found under his body. And if you are going to do some type of act like that, aren't you going to be aware of the potential for a suffocation risk? If you are the person that closed the zipper yourself, aren't you going to know how simple it is to pull that zipper back open, get your mouth to it, and try to get some air? Um, also, in the coroner's information, there were no marks found on his body. Now, the coroner did note his body was in a pretty advanced state of decomposition, which is one of the reasons why people are so critical of how long it took MI6 to actually call this in as a problem, and once again, might potentially make them look suspicious in terms of having something to do with this or knowing about it in some way. But um, there's just a lot of pieces of this puzzle that are really 
hard to put together. And looking at it as a pure suicide, I can see why the police have come to that assumption with the lack of evidence. But if you consider a scenario where the evidence has actually been removed, that kind of changes things a lot for me. Um, also, I have only seen it mentioned once. I think the possibility of him being killed somewhere else and then brought to this apartment is pretty, in, in my opinion, it's pretty feasible, especially when you consider that lock. Was the lock used to close him in so that he would truly suffocate, or was he potentially already poisoned and the lock was used so that someone transporting that bag would have less of a risk of someone opening that bag, wondering what's in that bag, um, asking him to open it if they were stopped by authorities of some kind, and he could say, hey, I don't have the key, this is a buddy of mine's gym stuff, or a buddy of mine's moving in and asked me to move this in for him. Um, I mean, that bag had to weigh a pretty substantial weight, but is it impossible that someone used some type of hand cart to get it up into the room, then lugged it into the bathroom and lifted it over into the tub? Um, and also in terms of thinking about it as a sexual act, in the tub, you know, I mean, if you're, I mean, I, I guess it's a place, but if you're going to do something like that and you really want to enjoy confining yourself in some type of tight space, are you going to do it in the tub? especially after you've had a scare like he supposedly had before where he handcuffed himself to the bed, wouldn't you think of some type of safety system? Once again, I go back to the true uh, art of escapism. Those guys are notorious for understanding the risks that they're putting themselves in and making sure they have methods to escape. Houdini didn't just lock himself up with no idea about what he was going to do. If you research it, that guy was notorious for hiding keys in very hard to find and unique places. Um, once again, did Gareth think that he had enough by bringing the key inside the bag with him? I don't know. But that still suggests that there might have been someone else that was there to actually lock it. And if that's the case, why are there no fingerprints found on the lock for Gareth or this other person? Very, very strange indeed. As a matter of fact, there's something even stranger, and this is weird because, once again, I can't find source information to really pinpoint where this information came from. Um, this is from an article from RT.com, and uh, this is only posted on the 16th of August, 2015. There have been revelations that have been coming out just in the past few months specifically about this case. I don't know if they're really revelations, but there's a lot of new theories uh, for sure that are kicking around, or it's possibly some type of misinformation campaign because the public has not let go of this death yet and probably are not um, buying the official police explanation. Fresh revelations relating to his death surfaced Saturday after a source told the Daily Mail that Scotland Yard officials believe an agent from another secret service broke into his apartment to conceal the evidence. The new claim alleges that forensic equipment laid down in the flat after William's body was discovered was moved while the building remained under the surveillance of armed police. They have these blocks that they would put, like for example, if they thought they found a footprint somewhere, there's this big black, almost like a lid, that they would put over that evidence. And apparently a bunch of those blocks were moved around only a day after this investigation started. And they're assuming and I, I still can't find good information to say where this is coming from or why this assumption is coming in. They're assuming that this person came in through the skylight because the apartment was actually being guarded at this point. But apparently while it was being guarded, someone else entered through the skylight, um, did a bunch of other possibly cleaning up, but they at least moved, um, the, in particular, those lids, those evidence lids that I'm talking about. It was noticeable the next day when the investigators came back to the scene. Um, it's also just curious, why would they come back in after the investigation was started? Um, I don't know, because theoretically they had a whole week up to that point to do whatever cleanup. They had already done, apparently, a pretty significant amount of cleanup. Um, were they tipped off by the investigation on the first day, and that prompted someone to go back in to further remove some evidence? I'm really not sure. In terms of theories, this is a new one that has kicked up. Clinton secrets hacked by spy in bag. Apparently, he breached, um, Gareth breached his own clearance rights and tapped into a 
guest list for a party that was being hosted by Bill Clinton. And he did this for a friend that asked him who apparently was going to this party. And there, are, there is some speculation that that upset his bosses. Um, it is interesting to note that the director of MI6 actually attended his funeral, I guess, with five additional people. And apparently that's unheard of. The director of MI6 uh, typically would not attend the funeral, particularly of someone that uh, they claim was kind of a low man on the totem pole, that uh, you know this guy was basically a, a data engineer in terms of MI6, uh, according to their initial information they put out. But the more and more info we get, it seems like he was more active than that. He was actually in the United States. He came to a couple of security conferences out here. Apparently, he was doing some type of collaboration with our NSA. So um, it seems like he was a bit more important than they initially let on. Uh, another theory that's been kicking around, a former KGB agent has been speaking out saying that he knows that Gareth was murdered, a poison was put in his ear uh, that is undetectable in the autopsy. Uh, I don't know if that guy's selling a book or what, but there are plenty of articles that you can bump into uh, speculating about that. And uh, in the latest twist, the guy, actually I don't have an article on it up right now, um, the guy that was trying to stuff himself in the bag is now also making some further comments saying that he believes that the female clothing found in Gareth's apartment was actually for undercover work that Gareth could quite easily cross-dress to alter his identity. And um, once again, I just I don't know how much stock uh, to hold in that. I think it's totally possible, it's totally feasible, but one of the questions is, uh, particularly for MI6, if they want a female agent, why wouldn't they just get a female agent? Why would you risk getting a male agent that could possibly de be detected as male when he's dressed as female? Um, Although I don't think it's out of the realm of feasibility nowadays that you would have a cross-dressing agent specifically to infiltrate some type of, uh, or get some information from a known culture of cross-dressers. Uh, I, I think it's a bit short-sighted to look at it in terms of only, if you want a woman, get a woman. If you want a man, get a man. Well, nowadays we have large organizations that are filled with people of all kinds of different gender identities. So it might not be so weird for him to be using that as part of uh, some type of covert op. Um, part of the Russian story, the ex-KGB agent, is that uh, Gareth was supposedly finding some money trails that led to some Russian mafia activity. Apparently a few Russian cars were noted around his apartment at the time of his disappearance. So um, there seems to be little trickles of information to support that theory as well. Finally, how feasible is it to lock yourself in the bag? Well, this is from SWNS TV, which is a YouTube channel, and I'm not going to run it from the start, but basically this is a woman. She's already crawled into the bag. She's got it zipped up closed, and she is now putting the lock on. As you can see, she left it open enough so that she could actually get the lock put into place there. And then once the lock is clipped into place, she's able to push it out and close up the zipper enough. So just to mix things up even further, it actually is feasible that he could have put the lock on himself. However, his fingerprint should be on it, and that was not the case. So, there are um, s many other aspects to this story. I'm just trying to give us kind of a concise starter to this. If you know more detail about this or have links, please drop them in the comment box below. I'm also really looking forward to your thoughts and opinions on this. Um, I can tell you right now, I am completely uncertain. This is a truly baffling mystery. Um, it appears to me that there is a misinformation campaign that is still actively going on. Uh, there's just so much information that is literally taking my attention in different directions, and none of it is really related to each other. The Bill Clinton breach, that really doesn't have anything to do with the Russian mafia breach, with the former KGB agent, which if he was a former KGB agent, why the hell would he know any of this current, relatively current information? Um, I mean, this just went down five years ago, and KGB hasn't, I think they've been dissolved for uh, 15, maybe 20 years now. Um, 
so there's definitely a lot of questions in terms of how the, this information is coming about and all the different directions it's going. There is some potential that another agency got to them. If it's Russian, if it's American, uh, I really don't know. It could be something completely unrelated to a secret case that we will never have exposure to or know about. So this is a tough one, but I'm really looking forward to your opinions on it. Thank you so much for joining me on this one. Um, and thanks to the Brain Scratchers that suggested it. I was originally trying to save this one for, I was going to do kind of a compilation of a few mysterious deaths that could be spy related. But once I started looking at the detail here, I, there was just so much detail to try to go through and to try to get out to make this um, somewhat a, a concise and full <laughs> version of this story that I just didn't feel like I could do it in a shorter segment where I could talk about other uh, mysterious deaths that kind of fit this criteria, uh, though they are out there. And for me personally, man, this is not the type of work that I would want to be doing, working for any of these agencies. I mean, uh, just knowing the stuff that we bumped into when we were investigating uh, the CIA operations and what they did to their own agents back in the 60s around the um, MK Ultra Operation Mockingbird stuff. Crazy, crazy world that these people live in. And um, it just really, I don't know how to feel about it in terms of the humanity of that whole way of being in this world. I understand that th they believe that they're protecting national security. I understand that there's a lot of those operations that can be shown at some point to have done something to affect our national security, but the types of uh, rules and regulations and how they seem to be able to weave in and out of those seemingly at will uh, honestly frightens me a bit, um, not particularly as a citizen, but for anyone that works within those organizations. I just, man, I don't know how you guys sleep at night. Thank you so much for joining me this week. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Brain Scratch and looking forward to reading your comments below. Have a great weekend and I will catch you next week. Take care. <laughs>